everyone, our next two speakers um, with, with Wisconsin Election Integrity. Uh, she is the coordinator of uh, their action team. Karen McKim, give a round of applause. And joining us from Trust Vote on Humble Transparency Project, Lori Grace. Um, thank you. Yes, is that this? This is working now, right? Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Um, I'm redid my presentation very quickly at you know right after the last speaker <laughs> um, to engage with some of the discussion that's going on. This is fascinating this afternoon, and I really love it. And the thing that um, I've added to start with that I didn't intend on starting with was I just want to pull us back up to 30,000 feet or whatever. I want to get us out of the weeds for, you know, whether we use paper ballots or digital images or risk limiting auditing or 100% or all those choices that do have to be made by responsible election officials and citizens about, you know, when we're going to verify our election results. But I want to just, I want to just remind everyone of the basic goals. I mean, like Mimi said this morning, you have to decide what your objective is. Our objective is to make sure our election results are accurate and that we've identified the right winners. And there's a certain number of characteristics. And again, Google best practices for risk, uh, best practices for post-election audits. And you'll find a couple of sets of these. But these are the major themes. Whatever you do to check your election results, you have to have a true and complete record of whatever, <laughs> of the ballots and the votes. You know, whether that is a true and complete paper record or the digital images of those records, whatever it is, you have got to pay attention to whether it is complete, or it's been tampered with, and whether it's true. Second, by the time you're done with the, out, uh, the audit, you have to have at least confirmed that you identified the right winner, if not the correct vote total for all the candidates. Um, and again, that's what you're trying to do. Uh, it's got to be timely. You've got to complete it while the errors can still be fixed. And now this may be a weird problem that Wisconsin election officials have. I hope the rest of you don't have this in your states. But Wisconsin does do post-election audits about a month after everyone's been sworn into office. <laughs> and you go, what? And I, again, it's, they, they say, you know, oh, we're just checking to make sure the machines were working right. You know, well, what if they weren't, you know? Um, but, but no, it's got to be done during the canvas. It's got to be timely. Um, and maybe the, this last dot is actually two dots. Um, it's got to be official. We've been doing citizens audits in Dane County, Wisconsin for, I don't know, three years now. And they can, citizens audits can never ever be anything more than demonstrations. You've got to have the local election officials themselves doing the audit. They're the only ones with the authority to change the, out, uh, change the results if they turn out to be wrong. They're the only ones that can really ensure that first dot there that the chain of custody is done. There's just all sorts of reasons why citizens' odds just aren't going to cut it. It's got to be official. And the last one is transparent. Um, Again, with things like the Academy Award winners and whatnot, you know, you can say, oh, well, this was audited by an independent audit firm and they're unbiased. Well, with elections, no one's unbiased. We all have a stake in the outcome. There is no one on this planet that does not, that is an unbiased observer of American election results. So to get around that lack of any disinterested, unbiased people, we have to be fully transparent. Everyone can see that this was done right with their own eyes. Okay, so those are the major principles. Whatever audit technique we're talking about, it's got to get those things done. Okay? Um, okay, I'm here just to show you one thing we've been doing, like I say, in Dane County, Wisconsin. That's where Madison is. Uh, we've got a lot of involved citizens there. Unfortunately, we don't have a cooperative county clerk. So a lot of what we've been doing is, you know, what's the most citizens can do when you have a county clerk who's goal in life is to do absolutely no more for you than he is absolutely required by law to do. And one of the things a Wisconsin county clerk is required by law to do is to turn over public records. 
And so we've been putting in open records requests after all the elections, 19, in 2015, 2016, and 2017, we submit open records requests. We get the digital images of the ballots on these little flash drives. This one I've got in my hand is the very first one we got from uh, February 2015. Now, what are these digital images and how were they created? Um, the new kinds of op scans aren't really optical scanners. They don't, there's no optical in their scanning. There's no light reflection. John's, John can do this better than I can, so if I say something wrong, correct me. The new kinds of optical scanners, the very second you put your ballot into that machine, a voter marked paper ballot, it creates a digital image, black and white pixels of that ballot, the instantaneously practically. And it saves it if the mean machine is set up to save it. And it counts your votes not by looking at your ballot, but by detecting pixels on this digital image it created. And then it creates something called a cast vote record, which is just a list of the ballots. So basically, you have three things. You have the paper ballot itself, you have the digital image that was instantaneously created and saved, and you have the cast vote record. Now, they should all be in agreement with each other, and if you have a good system, that you should be able to check one against the other sooner or later some way. What we've been doing in Dane County is we, oh, the di digital images, they're saved, they're actually saved onto a little flash drive like this right inside the voting machine. When the polls close, the poll workers open up a door, they pull out the flash drive and they put it in a little zipper seal packet and they send it straight to the county clerk's office. Again, now this is how it works in Wisconsin. So <clears throat> midnight, one, two in the morning, whatever, uh, the county clerk has a little flash drive from every voting machine in the county that has digital images on it. He inserts that into the central county computer. The images are downloaded and stored on the big central county computer. Then how I got this was then the county clerk inserted another, this clean, you know, fresh, unused flash drive and copied all the digital images onto this and gave them to me. Now, if you had a cooperative county clerk that understood and was willfully understanding what you need to do to create a good audit, there would be written procedures for this, this chain of custody, and there would be a way to verify that these were complete and correct. But we don't have that right now. So uh, this is all just a demonstration. And every time we've audited election results in Dane County, we stress that, that until we have a county clerk that is willing to pay attention to things like chain of custody, this has just got to be a demonstration. It's just decorative or showing what could be done. Mm. <clears throat> the other thing is right now that um, the clerks, the election officials that ha actually have charge of the machines don't use the digital images for anything or even the cast vote record. So they don't pay attention to see if it's correct or not. And every time we've checked thoroughly after an election, we've never gotten a full set of ballots. There's always been one or two precincts missing, one or two precincts that were double copied. You know, again, right now this is just a demonstration. We went ahead with our citizens' audits anyway, but a, a real county clerk that was really interested in doing it right, <laughs> that wouldn't be a problem. Um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> why use the digital images and not the paper ballots? You know, if I'd won the race when I ran for county clerk, um, you know, I would have established a committee of audit people and IT people and election people and really dug into that question. You know, what are the pros and cons? Auditing paper ballots, working with digital images. As citizens, we didn't have much choice. We had to take what we could get. And in Wisconsin, you can see the paper ballots, but you can't touch them. And listen, I'm not making this up. The Rock County clerk one time for a hand-counted uh, audit, but wanted to be cooperative, but she wanted, she couldn't let us touch the ballots. <laughs> so the only way we could count the paper ballots was to put on rubber gloves so that our skin, <laughs> I'm not making that up, <laughs> so, so that our skin wouldn't come in touch with the ballots and we weren't touching them. Um, yeah. But anyway, so to go ahead and figure out what really could be done by a county clerk that wanted to do this, we use the digital images. And the two big advantages are transparency, which I'll show you in a second, how very transparently you can count votes from digital image ballots, and speed. Um, 
We, we uh, verify using, using digital images to, to speed up the actual counting of the ballots and using risk limiting auditing to cut down the number of ballots that we had to look at before we could say we're confident that it's right. We were able to verify the outcome in the uh, Madison mayoral primary in 20 minutes for Dane County, well, City of Madison. Uh, and we were able to verify the countywide outcome in a Supreme Court race in about 45 minutes, or between 45 minutes and an hour. It can go really fast when you use both risk limiting auditing and digital ballot image viewing. And that just takes away the county clerk's excuse that they don't have time to check their work. They do. Um, okay. I'll, remind me to come back to this slide. Well, I'll do it now. There's a YouTube video uh, of uh, the very, well, the second time we did a public audit with digital ballot images. It's on YouTube at that, that YouTube address. And the open source software for viewing the digital images and using them in an audit is online. It's open source. Uh, it was developed by a wonderful guy who works with our group called Paul Lindquist, who's a Microsoft programmer, um, for free. And it's at github.com. Well, you can see the address there. Um, the version that's online is the one that uses dot .pbm in images that are saved by Dane County's ESNS DS200. And Paul's told me that he could alter this software to pick up image, use images created by other machines. And I guess they're not all saved as .pbm. But okay, let me um, show you how it works. Um, it's not pretty. <laughs> There's not a lot of graphics design in this thing yet. When you start an audit, this is, what? It's not up there? What do I do? I, I can see it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put the flash drive containing the ballots there. Oh, oh okay. Now you, you can see it. What? No, I can see it, but um, all right, launch the application again. Turn the application off and relaunch. Okay. Mm. No, she has software that she has to run, and it's yeah. only on her machine. But we saw it earlier. I don't know. Hey, okay. Eric, do you have any idea? If any, you can fill it, I idea? can talk. Oh. No, that's, that's me. Okay, I can talk. What it does is it, the, it, the digital ballot images come up, and I wanted you to see them so you could see the resolution. And I mean, it's just really a, looks like a black and white photograph of the ballot. What this software does is, um, okay, good. Magic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, for, okay, I'm going to open it. And here's the, the, that's the little flash drive that contains the ballots. I'm going to open the ballot images. Now these are, the ballot images are sorted by ward, by polling place. And the first time we did this, we were doing risk limiting audit with batches. We would do entire precincts and, ex and select the precincts at random. Uh, later on, we developed a way that we could randomize the ballots countywide, and we started doing ballot risk limiting audit. But I'll, I'll just go ahead and do a precinct. Now, I know Madison Ward uh, 23 is really small, and it'll load fast. So. <laughs> We're going to look at Ward 23. Uh, 
Okay, here's uh, the first ballot. Up at the top, you can see it says Madison City Ward 23. It says it's ballot number one of 47 ballots. I told you it was small. And this is the ballot. Now, if there was a, if there was, if this ballot had a back, it would be over here, but this is the front of the ballot. And again, this is straight the way it comes out of the machine. It's a zipped file, but this um, application unzips it. Now, um, up, I can see part of the ballot. I can make it bigger. Now, again, if we were doing some kind of an official audit, and I was actually county clerk, you know, I'd have invited some poll workers to come in and check that those were their signatures and whatnot. There's different ways you could do that. Um, but again, this ballot only had one. It was the Madison mayoral primary. So let's zoom in on this. Okay, now there's the first ballot and there's the Madison mayoral primary. There's five candidates and a write-in space. Now, what we used to do in our citizens' audits, and what I would do if we were doing a real one, is I'd have distributed a little metal click counters so you hold in your hand. And I would say, who wants to count for Scott Resnick? And give you clickers. Who wants to count for Richard Brown? Who wants to count for Christopher Daly? Who wants to count Bridget and Paul and write-ins and blank ballots? And I would have to pick at least two people <clears throat> to be the lead counters for each one of those candidates. And then when we were ready to start, I'd say, okay, all the Paul Soglin counters, click once, because you're looking at the first ballot and it's a Paul Soglin vote. So your counter should read one, and now everyone else's counter should read zero. And if you want to, go ahead and pick one of the candidates yourself. You can count in your head, too. Now, I'm gonna, when I click resume, the ballots are gonna start to go by, it's showing you just this section of the ballot at a rate of, um, what do I have this set at? I, I have this set at 1.5 seconds. This is variable. Um, and actually, through experience, we've learned that the first two batches or so, people prefer 1.5 seconds. And then by the time they get to their third or fourth batch, they say that's too slow. And, the, and it actually helps accuracy a little bit if they can go a little faster for some reason. So one second is actually what we found to be optimal, but I'll leave it at 1.5. Um, okay, now here's the tragic part. When I copied the software onto this little tablet surface, it's malfunctioning at this point. And if it was on the old laptop, I could show you for real, but you'll get the feel of it. Um, it's, when I hit resume, it would start through the ballots, and that, this number would go up. One, two, three, four, five, as the ballots went by, and it would stop at 25. But um, for some reason on this Surface tablet, it's not working right, and so you <laughs> Yeah, well. Um, I'm going to hit resume. The ballot display is going to start. Ignore, there's going to be an error message come up. You ignore it. Your counters, you just count votes. Pick your candidate, keep your eyes on the votes, count every time you see a ballot, a vote for the candidate you've picked. Um, okay, here I go. Oh, it's, it's going to skip something, so it's not going to be 25. Okay, who was counting first? Paul Soglin, raise your hand. How many votes did you get? Three six. six? Everyone counting for Soglin got six? Okay, if this was an out, then I would write six on a board over here, and we'd, we'd do the other candidates, and everyone would agree. If we didn't agree, then... Um, then I could hit resume, and we'd play the same batch of 25 ballots over again. And we keep going that way through all the ballots until we finish the precinct, and we would um, be done <laughs> with that precinct. 
Um, this is a picture, if you can see it, of what it really looked like when we did it, one, of, one of the citizens' audits. Um, you know, people were seated around the room with little clickers, counting votes. Uh, the ballots were being displayed over here. We also just displayed an Excel spreadsheet with the subtotal so everyone could track that. And again, you know, you can verify the outcome in a countywide race in less than an hour or so. Um, the other thing, if you noticed on the software, down at the bottom here, you have a link to the, Phil Stark's website. And uh, our software developer built that in because, uh, now I'm going to go back to the beginning. We would have called up the application before we even picked a precinct or any votes at all. We would have set, plugged in the information here for the race we wanted to verify. We would have plugged in the number of ballots cast. We would have plugged in the contest name. Uh, we, this says winners won. Actually, the race I just showed you was a primary, so there were two winners. So we had to verify that the top two vote getters, so I'd, I'd change this to two if we'd be doing that. Put in the candidates' names and, and the risk limit that I want. I uh, change that. Um, and then once I, once I hit enter, is Phil Stark still in the room? I didn't see him. Okay. Um, then you click, uh, where is it? Calculate, and it tells you what your size of your first sample is. Now, the, this website also has a random sampling function in it. This input seed here, the other thing I'd, we'd bring to the chem, not just the little click counters, but a 10-sided dice we'd bring. And we'd, you know, throw that at one of the public members and they'd roll it. And we'd generate digits for a, a seed number here and then click that. And then it would say which ballots we needed to pick for the random selection. Our software programmer developed a way that he could develop what's called a manifest. All of the, um, all of the ballots that are on this little flash drive, it could assign him a number so that when this randomly selected, you've got to include ballot number 13,345 in the audit, it could pull it for us. And because the, it was in order, okay, um, you could see, oh, that's the 35th ballot in the village of Cross Plains. And then on that screen you saw, you can see ballot number 35, village of Cross Plains at the top. Now, um, the other thing with the random, the selection size, sometimes with really lopsided races, and Dane County has a lot of them, it's very democratic, um, you plug all the numbers into this website here and it says, the uh, sample size you need to get a 99% confidence level is 27 ballots. <laughs> and we were doing this for the public, and we developed this language, like, okay, that's statistical confidence, what would emotional confidence be? <laughs> and then just with the participants in the room, they'd say, oh, it's gotta be at least 200 ballots, at least 200, you know. And okay, sample size is 200, and we'd plug 200 in instead of the number that the application generated. And of course, once you actually start counting ballots in a lopsided race, either you could say confidence build or boredom builds. I mean, people keep, get so tired of seeing Paul Soglin go by. <laughs> they, okay, okay, I'm convinced. You know. Um, so I wanted to touch on that. And I, I, I got my five minute warning, but I, I always prefer uh, questions rather than lecturing. So I'm just going to say any uh, questions, and then Lori. Oh, can I ask a question, Karen? Um, good. Uh, yeah. As I'm listening to this, I've been thinking about ballot styles for a long time because we are moving in LA from an Incavote card, which is essentially an elongated plaque piece of cardboard with dots. And the dots mean different things in every different precinct, because we have rotating 
um, candidate and ballot numbers as well as, of course, different races depending on the geography of where you live in Los Angeles. So, four million, uh, uh, four thousand precincts, different dots. So I was thinking, God, uh, this is going to be a hard audit. So we're moving to something called selections only, where it's a human readable selection. You know, Mimi Kennedy, Karen McKim. But it's selections only. So depending on what you choose on the new on prototype, the what prints out on your paper ballot, and it will be, by the way, that paper ballot that is counted. The machine is not counted internally. We insisted that that did not happen. There will be that paper ballot is the ballot of record. I don't know. They're looking into ballot images as well, so depending on, and we'll hear from John Brakey, whether those are equivalent, but you don't see any dots, you don't have who all the candidates are, so you'd have to be keeping in your head. Anyway, I'm wondering, short question, do you have any preferred ballot styles, or does anybody here thinking about auditing that as our registrars and officials move to different voting systems, we can say this would be better than that. Because I liked the idea of a human readable ballot, but it will be in nine languages. So that would, if I were a hand counter, and it has to be, that's by law, um, uh, if I had to hand count in Arabic or Japanese, I will be able to do this. Every ballot choice, whether it's a referendum or a candidate, will have the equivalent of an airline locator number, say LD1, or you know, M I might always be MB3, no matter what happens on any rotating candidate thing. So I would be in Japanese kanji, but I would be LB3. So if I'm hand counting all the ballots and I come across kanji ballot, I know that's Mimi Kennedy, LB3. But of course, the previous presentation this morning said, look how these things can change when you have a certain kind of character. Um, the image in L, L can change to an R, or a B can change to a 6, or a 3 can change to an 8. So, I leave that question open. What kind of ballot styles do we want for audit purposes? <laughs> that question, singular? That <laughs> that's a plural, plural. I, so many good issues she raised, and uh, yeah, I, went, I wanted to demonstrate this just to show you we were doing with one thing I wanted to encourage, you know, think creatively about the things we have and what we can use in our equipment. And yeah, there's so, I'm sorry Wisconsin's never gonna have California ballot issues. It's just, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and there's gonna have to be solutions in different jurisdictions. Um, I also wanted to touch on the fact that I mean the machines you were describing. I'm not sh they, I'm not sure they create automatically automatically created digital images. These machines, I know these machines, and they do. And I'm comfortable doing this with automatically created digital images. You know, the, when you first insert your ballot, it snaps a picture of it right away. I know Phil said it wasn't a picture, but whatever it is. Um, if you have to take paper ballots and humanly scan them somehow, that creates a different step, and I, I haven't thought that through. Yeah, and but the other thing, Lulu mentioned this uh, next week or next the week after next, we're going to be doing a hand count in Racine of ballots that had been counted by an Optech Eagle that doesn't have digital. I mean, we're going to use the paper ballots, and we've we've already asked the county clerk, and she hasn't said yes yet. But what we want to do is have her, you know, have a document projector, the kind they use in classrooms, and just slide the paper ballots across it at, at you know, this kind of like, and just so we can have everyone in the room counting the votes all at the same time for that transparency thing. Because, I mean, you've probably all observed hand counts where you're watching over someone's shoulder sitting at a table, and there's no way you can tell if they're counting right or not. And, you know, there's any number of different ways you can project ballots on screens. And we've got to figure them out. And, okay. <laughs>